Jackson Fittipaldi in the closing laps. An Emma mistake gave Al his second Indianapolis win. Last week at Milwaukee, Al scored again. Now three in a row with Penske cars. One, two, and three. But the season is more than Al. It is Penske. Emerson Fittipaldi scored the Phoenix win. The Nigel Bennett design passy is fast. No matter what engine it carries. The only other chassis to win this year was Michael Andretti's Renard, taking the season's first race at Surfer's Paradise in Australia. A podium finish for father and son. The question mark is red number one, defending PPG champion Nigel Mansell and his Newman Haas Lola. His season has been less than spectacular, with no wins thus far, and at Phoenix, a big mistake. Today, Nigel and the rest ask the same question. Can Al Unser be stopped? From the magnificent Belle Isle in the Detroit River, just off of Detroit on the border between the United States and Canada, ABC Sports presents the ITT Automotive Detroit Grand Prix. The official ceremonies are already underway down at the pit entrance. Let's go a little further up the pit road to Gary Gerald. Paul, the recent dominance of the Penske team could be very seriously challenged here in the streets of Belle Isle today. And the man who's expected to do the bulk of the challenging, Nigel Mansell, who starts in the pole position. He had an electrifying qualifying run yesterday, broke his own track record by a second and a half. He's a half second faster than the fastest of the Penske's. And that's Al Unser Jr., who's just alongside in the front row, Paul Tracy, Emerson Fittipaldi, behind him in row two. And if that's not enough incentive to beat that Penske jogger not today, consider also 135000 thousand dollar Marlboro bonus on the line if Nigel Mansell can win this race from the pole position. Now let's go back to row three and Jack Aroot. Gary, this logo was missing from the Indianapolis 500, but it's back in row three and back in Detroit with a vengeance. Part of the engine package for Ray Hall Hogan Racing, and Bobby Ray Hall has qualified quite well. It's a new, updated version of the Honda engine behind Bobby Ray Hall today, and people must remember that it took three years in Formula One competition before Honda was victorious. Many people feel it'll be sooner in IndyCar competition. Then there's the story of the fourth Brazilian in IndyCar competition, Mauricio Guzelmin, teammate to Michael Andre has qualified on the outside of that third row. He hopes to join his teammate Michael Andretti in victory lane. Andretti winning for Renard first time out in Australia. He qualified far better than his teammate Andretti did here in Detroit. Paul? Well, a little bit earlier, there was a threat of rain in the area. It seems to have dissipated for now, but we're going to be watching these skies behind us over downtown Detroit because that is from where the weather comes. Now, we mentioned Michael Andretti. He is definitely a car to watch here today. Every race at Detroit that he's been in, he's been starting on the pole. Not so today. He starts 17th. In his one victory in 1990, Michael Andretti ran every lap at the head of the race. But Michael Andretti now has a challenge ahead of him. The road courses are beginning. Michael scored his only win this year on a road course. In this next series of races for IndyCar, if Michael is going to get into that points fight, it is going to have to happen now. Well, now, though, we are ready for all 28 IndyCars to accept that command to start their engines. So let's go down at the starting line for those famous words. Detroit's Mayor Dennis Archer. Drivers, start your engines! Andretti ready for his last start here in Detroit. The Penske team confident of victory once again. We will see if that happens. When we come back, we have more leading up to the start of the Grand Prix here in Detroit. Brought to you by ITT. When it comes to building business, at ITT we're adding more than just our name. Buick and your local Buick dealers. Remember Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. Budweiser, Beachwood Age for a crisp, clean, classic taste. And Haviland Formula 3 motor oil. Add more life to your car. 
the Renaissance Center, the centerpiece of downtown Detroit, not far away from Belle Isle. Just below the shot, the island itself and the racetrack. The Indy cars are already rolling on their parade lap. So let's take a look at the starting grid. On the pole is Nigel Mansell. He has only won once on a road course in his IndyCar career, alongside Allinger Jr. looking for four in a row. In row two, Paul Tracy, a third last week at Milwaukee, and Emerson Fittipaldi, a two-time winner here in Detroit. Row three, Mauricio Guzman, the fastest rookie qualifier, and Bobby Rahal, the winner of the first race here on the island. In row four, rookie Jacques Villeneuve. And Teo Bobby in the first IndyCar race in Detroit, he finished fourth. Row five, Mario Andretti and Robbie Gordon. Row six, Stefan Johansson and Adrian Fernandez. Row seven, Ari Leyendijk and Raul Boisel. In the eighth row, Mike Groff and Christian Danner. Row nine, the 90 winner, Michael Andretti and Brian Herta. Row 10, Jimmy Vassar and Frederick Eckblum. Row 11, Scott Goodyear and Marco Greco. In the 12th row, Mark Smith and Dominic Dobson. Alessandro Zampedri and Scott Sharp make up row 13. And the 14th row, Buddy Lazier and Willie T. Ribs. So that's the way they line up as the wind picks up here on the edge of the Detroit River. The question, Sam, is can the Penske team be beaten? Oh, Paul, I think things are still wide open. After all, this is only the sixth of 16 races. And I believe personally that Nigel Mansell, the defending champion, is about to come on really strong. When you think of what's going on in the world of hockey with the Rangers and the Canucks, it just proves that in pro sports today, anything can happen. No question about that. But Bobby Unzer, the man who wins today, what's it going to take? Well, Paul, I think that the driver that wins here today is going to be one with real courage. The track has mostly medium and fast turns. The slow turns really have no place to pass. Therefore, I think that passing here is going to become a factor of being brave and taking some real chances. All right, so the cars are rolling. We're ready to start the pace lap. And when we come back, the green flag will come out over the Indy cars. Back at the ITT Automotive Detroit Grand Prix, the Indy cars are now on the pace lap itself. As the pace car begins to pull just a bit away, here is the challenge as we look ahead to 77 laps here. And Danny Sullivan, last year's winner, of course, is not racing in the Indy cars this year. Earliest possibility, we think, for a pit stop would be on lap 15. The view back from Nigel Mansell's car, one of the onboard cameras we'll have for you, as well as this magnificent view over the left-hand side of Robbie Gordon's car and Michael Andretti's car as well. Further onboard cameras throughout in the field as well. We'll show them to you during the running of the race. Remember, the start here was so controversial last year. The rule is the pole sitter has to get to the line first. The pole sitter is on his way. In fact, a good start over the line. He gets well ahead of second place as he comes to the line. One engine could already be in trouble. We've seen a couple of puffs there as Mansell takes the lead of the race. Well, Mansell sure didn't let happen what happened last year. He had about two car lengths ahead of Little Al last year. He got snooker a little bit by Emerson Fittipaldi. Uh -oh. And Mike Groff already off the course and into the tire barrier. That will bring out a local yellow. The IndyCar safety team already there helping him. It's amazing what these tire barriers do. The drivers sometimes drive in there well over 100 miles an hour. It doesn't ever seem to hurt much, Paul. With Team Penske in pursuit, Nigel Mansell pulling away from the field. Remember that last year, he did not do well on road courses. A great surprise to everybody. But now, little Al begins to close on Nigel Mansell. Mansell's success last year depended on his skill on the ovals, which he had never run on. You mentioned that he wasn't good on road courses, Paul. He must now reverse that trend this year if he's going to be champion. Bunch of road courses coming up in the next few weeks. He must excel if he's going to erode the Penske lead. Paul Tracy sits in third, Emerson Fittipaldi in fourth. And then Mauricio Guzelmin, as he comes off of the corner with Bobby Rahal finding new power in that Honda engine, comes off just behind Guzelmin. On that Honda engine, Bobby Rahal has an engine that is now firing with the same order as the Cosworth Fords and as the Elmore engine, Paul. And it seems to have made a lot more horsepower. What that means is they fired two pistons simultaneously. On the nose of Bobby Rahal's car, tail Bobby just behind, Guzel means just ahead. Bobby, it means, of course, the engine sounds differently. They Ari are aiming Leyendijk, for torque. Ari Leyendijk into the pits, unscheduled, obviously. We'll keep track of that. Back with Bobby Rahal, he runs in sixth. 
the big changes to that engine were to get it more torque, which would help it accelerate, of course, off the turns, which would be ideal for this track. And he qualified better today or yesterday than he has in some time. People that have normal engines drive on the highway, fire one piston at a time. The difference being, Sam, is explain a little farther is they fire two pistons at one time, makes an eight-cylinder almost like a four-cylinder. Two cars with an early visit to the pits. One of them, you saw a moment ago, Ari Leindyke, but Gary Gerald also Stefan Johansson. Indeed, Paul, real problem is they came in on the right rear, had just been totally shredded and demolished. We don't know where the contact was, but he obviously was in a first lap incident. They've made the change, fresh rubber. He's back out, but now at the back of the field. And take a look at Al Unser Jr. as he comes around Mansell, and little Al picks up the lead. Yes, and you know, I passing is so hard here, I almost missed that when it happened so fast. Yeah, like you said, it's hard here. He just zoomed right around. Yeah. Now, Paul Tracy comes up to challenge. Now, Paul cannot afford to sit behind Mantle too long because little Al is getting away. Obviously, Mantle's not working as good here. There he goes right there, and he... Wow, he him out. that was clean a pass, good. and I think Paul Tracy knows that he cannot at this stage in the season, with only one third place to give him points, afford to make any mistakes. He made a mistake at Indy, he made others. He must drive clean races. We were all sitting here cringing, Sam, when that pass happened because we didn't know if it was going to fit or not. So now it's Emerson Fittipaldi that begins to line up on Nigel Mansell. Though here in the early laps, Mansell can take his time. Here was the pass as Al Unser Jr. came right down to the inside on the exit of the corner. Boy, nice piece of driving there. Is that chassis handling well? And the idea is, is of course, to block him out, which little Al has him blocked now where he can't do anything. And if you notice, straightaways are so short, Paul, he had to really get a... He had to really get an early start at him. Take a look at this. This is the accident involving, involving Mike Groff, which also involved Lion Dyke and Johansson. But Groff hopped across one of the barrier strips and straight on into the tires. Now, sometimes Mansell has let the others set the pace early in the race. I doubt very much that that's what he had in mind here. Uh, I think Mansell is going as hard as he can now, but we have seen him in other races play the role of the Fox, drop back a little bit. But you could tell, Sam, he wasn't going to do that here because you could see that start. Mansell was going at it from the very beginning. Emerson Fittipaldi now closes on Nigel Mansell. That lens will push the following car back just a little bit, but still it's a spectacular shot. Whereas psychologically, when you're in the car, the guy behind you seems huge in your mirrors. Big difference. So Fittipaldi now in pursuit of Mansell. Al Enzer Jr. has the lead. No driver has ever won at both Milwaukee and Detroit. Seems though, like we said something earlier this year, no one had ever won at Long Beach in Indianapolis. Little Al is rewriting the record books. Well, only three drivers in this field have complete, competed in all six Detroit Grand Prix. Interestingly, a real changing of the guard issue. Now, Emma's faced with the same decision that Tracy had. He's going to have to take a hard run while his tires are good at Mansell or forget about passing Mansell at least until after the pit stops. You see the rest of the group coming down in pursuit behind Fittipaldi, Guzman, Rahal, Bobby, Vilnep, and Robbie Gordon. Rahal looking for a position on Mauricio Guzman. Now remember, this track, unlike a lot of the others, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, has no real long straightaways with hairpin or real long turns at the end, which is normally where the passing happens. Watching fifth through ninth, tenth place now is Mario Andretti. Guzman, the first car in this group here, is a veteran of 74 Grand Prix. His best finished ever was third. This is that great helicopter shot. Remember, the helicopter can fly at about 130 miles an hour. Indy cars just drive right away from it. Sure gives you a good idea which way the turns go and what the drivers have to be looking at. That's the battle for the front of the field. Here it is again. It's first Al Unser Jr. and then Paul Tracy. Remember last week at Milwaukee, the Penske's did not qualify right at the front, but once the race started, they just swarmed to the front. That was a one-mile oval, a completely different configuration than this track. Here again, almost the same thing happens. Mansell seemed to have them handled in qualifying and then has surged, uh, hey, they have surged past him. So at the front of the field, Nigel Mansell, who picks up the lead from the pole, is then passed by first Unser Jr. and then Paul Tracy. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. For the first time in his IndyCar career, Al Unser Jr. is leading at Detroit in the ITT Automotive Detroit Grand Prix. 
but there was earlier incident and now a yellow outstanding to guard this car Raul Boisel Jack what's the story here well, Paul, we checked with Raul Boisel with his crew, and Mo Nunn is calling the shots down here. Mo, what did Raul tell you over the radio about the condition of the car? Uh, Ra Raul said the dash just went out and the engine uh, engine died. Other than that, we don't know. Has it refired? Sorry? Has it refired? No. Paul, they seem to think it might be an electronic problem, but from all the smoke that we saw, it also could be an expired motor. Well, we'll keep an eye on Raul Boisel, who's in a precarious position. What you just saw was Teo Fabi, as he had to maneuver out and around none other than Mike Groff. There's Groff's car. He was involved in that incident earlier on, and he's back out on the course. But now they go to a full course yellow, and that is to recover the car of Raul Boisel. They thought that was too precarious a position, and so we're now full course yellow. The field will line up behind the PPG pace car and Al Unser, Jr., and reform and we'll go racing again with eight laps complete here of the 77 in Detroit. We're back at the ITT Automotive Detroit Grand Prix still under a full course yellow. And here they've been concerned about tire pressures, checking pressures there, but there's another pressure. Yeah, that's right. Detroit, one of the cities for the World Cup. And Saturday, back again ABC Boston Sports wins. coverage of World Cup good. 94 begins. The USA takes on Switzerland live beginning at 11.30 in the morning Eastern, 8.30 Pacific. Then the world's best golfers take aim at our national title, the U.S. Open Golf Championship. Live weekend coverage begins Saturday at 1.30 Eastern, 10.30 Central, right here on ABC Sports. So there's the field, lined up with Al Unser Jr. at the head, followed by Paul Tracy, Nigel Mansell, and Emerson Fittipaldi. Now, during the yellow, we've had a second car roll to a stop, and that was Mike Groff. We'll get an update on that in a moment. The Goodyear Blimp Spirit of Akron is floating overhead, providing aerial views of the Detroit Grand Prix. The Goodyear Blimp has been flying over major events for 61 years, and there she is. So gentle in the sky overhead. There is Mike Groff now climbing out of that car after he drove it to a stop there. Jack Aroot, do you have any idea what the problem is here? Paul, believe it or not, first in that first altercation, he damaged some suspension pieces, and now there's some suspect that maybe in that altercation he might have damaged his brakes as well because he reported in that he ran out of brakes. And his brakes are inoperative, so he cannot continue, especially on a road course here. One other item to remember, Paul, is the Honda engine aboard Mike Groff's car is not the new updated version of the Honda engine that Bobby Rahal is driving. He's using the older type engine in competition. Didn't last too long. Jack, in the slow-mo replay of the accident itself, there were a lot of parts bouncing around in the course, but those apparently were not Mike Groff's. Were they Lion Dykes? Well, that's what happened is everybody did a little bumper tag out there. And, and one of the things that we saw, Paul, as you know, a lot of the designers now have taken these front wing sections and they're able to replace them in approximately 25 to 30 seconds during a pit stop. All that carbon fiber you saw flying came from Ari Leyendijk's car. He came in minus both front wings. Jack, the interesting thing, of course, is that that engine of Mike Groff's was the Honda that was supposed to be bulletproof. It's the one in Ray Hall's car that has the question mark surrounding it. He blew one up here on Friday. He blew one up in testing uh, earlier in the week. Let's take a have a look at that engine. At that situation earlier. Now watch all of the parts. Groff's going to come flying through. Yeah, that's definitely Ari Leyendijk parts. You can see him going down through the center as well. But he can get the car turned. Groff cannot. You can see by those wings how light they are. They're made out of carbon fiber type materials and they float. They're just light as a feather. There goes Groff into the tires. And of course, that really absorbs the energy. Jack, you have more? Well, Sam, the thing that I was going to answer Sam Posey's question, the engine is tried and true and proven. It didn't fail them today. It happened to be the mechanical problems from that little altercation riding up over Lion Dyke that, and Johansson. The motor was still running fine. So you still under a full course yellow here as there's some of the rescue divers just off the edge of the track in the river just in case they're needed. We hope not. Behind that wall they have pushed Raul Boisel's car. He is out of the race very early on. Jack Roots close by. Well, old boys out, tough luck, but first, what puts you out? 
Uh, my Duracell Lola was running perfect, uh, a lot better than in qualify. I was positioned myself, and uh, you know, it's just uh, you know, an electrical problem. What about the run out here? What were the track conditions like in the early going? We're looking at that camera right directly across the, the front of the well, safety the, car. The there. track has been pretty good. It's not uh, slippery as uh, I thought it would be because of, of the heat. So it uh, will be good for the tires. It will be good for, for, the, for the general race. Tough break. Tough break, yes. Tough to see him out early on. We're looking for Mike Groff as well who uh, climbed out of his car. You saw him running back, and there is his car on its way back, still under full course yellow. And, of course, it's doubly frustrating for Raul Bosell to be out of the race because he is so physically fit. He prepares with such intensity. He loves this sport so much. and to, 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 There's nothing worse for a driver than not to have a chance even to get tired doing what you love. What happened to Groff was is he had his accident into the tires, and it obviously almost broke something. He got back on the racetrack, was able to run for a little bit, and then the part broke because when the wrecker was hooking up to it, I could look at the front tires and they weren't anywhere near lined up. So it was all chassis problems instead of engine problems on his car. Went from an almost break to a real break as we take a look at the field lined up behind the pace car. We'll look at the entire field as they come down here. 20 laps under yellow here at Detroit in both 1992 and 93. Thus far, we have had six laps under yellow here. We're on lap 13. Let's go to Gary. We're watching uh, Stefan Johansson go back onto the circuit ball. He came in for a splash of fuel. They also wanted to take a look at one of the key suspension pieces on the right rear. Apparently, no damage from that earlier incident. They want to get him with a heavy load of fuel. Maybe he can gain some of the advantage back when everybody else has to make their first pit stop. There's an interesting tactic, Bobby. Well, it's it, it's good and it's bad. They just really wanted to check the suspension. Otherwise, it's going to be really bad because he's back behind all of these cars, and it's very difficult to pass. And he won't enjoy this stop until everybody else makes their pit stops. Well, he has a personal motto, Stefan does. Honesty plus humor equals happiness. I think it keeps him steady. He's going to need steadiness right now because he's got his work cut out for him. But we know he's not too happy right now about that stop <laughs> It kind of spoils the equation, doesn't it? <laughs> Again, with lap 13 now coming to completion, uh, the indication is we should go back to green flag very shortly here. The field is closed up once again. The race started with Nigel Mansell on the pole. He jumped to the lead. In fact, a good jump at the start. And then Al Unser Jr. came around. And right after that, Paul Tracy moved into second place behind Little Al. So now Paul Tracy moves to the inside of Little Al as they all anticipate a green flag as soon as they come down to this bending front straightaway that includes the pits and the start-finish line. There's the bend just before. The pace picks up. Allinger Jr. brings them back toward the green flag. Idea, of course, at a restart is to gain as much advantage as you can so the guy behind you can't take a swing at you going into the turn. And that's obviously what little Al and Paul Tracy were trying to do. I'll tell you what, it's exhilarating from where we watch to see these restarts. We are sitting literally right on the edge of the track, overlooking the wall, just a few feet down from the start-finish line. When the cars go past here under acceleration, they actually rock the broadcast booth back and forth. Emerson Fittipaldi taking a look at Nigel Mansell now. Guzelmin at the same time looking at Fittipaldi. Looking back through the field now. There's Guzelmin. <laughs> There's Ray Hall. The yellow Pennzoil car is Bobby. Then Vilnep and Robbie Gordon in the Valvoline car. We ride with Robbie Gordon, Jack Aroot. And Paul, Robbie Gordon has his share of problems this afternoon, not in the cockpit of the car as you ride along with him, but on pit road. All these teams need base stations in order to maintain radio communications all the way around this big racetrack in Belle Isle. The base station for Team Walker has conked out. They're working on it, but so far Derek Walker and the team can only speak to Robbie Gordon as he comes down the front stretch and heads into turns one and two. You've got to be brief and got to be specific and definitive. Well, the good news is that the telemetry coming out of that car to Ford Electronics is terrific. Notice that he is using mostly fifth and second gear. He only really passes through third gear for a little while and then comes back down into second whenever he gets in traffic. And notice he's turning a little over 13,000 RPM, Paul. And again, you mentioned the second. I was going to mention that. He runs an awful lot of this track in second gear because the straightaways are so short and the turns are somewhat of the same radius. 
There's talk of Robbie Gordon going into Winston Cup racing with his longtime mentor, Michael Cranifus, who has formed a team looking for a really hot driver. This is a man very high on his list. That would be a loss, of course, to IndyCar racing. Michael Cranifus has been prominent here at the track this weekend. Just ahead of Gordon, Villeneuve, and then Fabi, Bobby Rahal now sits in sixth place. We'll come up and take a look at Rahal as he chases Mauricio Guzelmin. Yes, and I was just going to mention as you watch the uh, telemetry stuff coming out on the engine and stuff, everybody probably wonders, how does the driver know when to shift? They actually get to where they can hear the engine. You notice the rev limiters will cut off on Robbie Gordon's, for example, just above 13,000, but he can hear that engine, so he shifts just before the rev limiter comes in. Coming back to the lead at the Detroit Grand Prix as we take a look at Al Unser Jr. with Paul Tracy now beginning to give him some pressure. This is the first time this year that we've really seen a clear battle between Al Unser Jr. and Paul Tracy, two very hot men for the Penske team. Obviously, I said earlier, I believe Tracy is under a lot of pressure not to make a mistake. He's running well back in the championship, 16th. He really needs a success and he needs to stay on the road. Pit side once again, Gary Gerald as Adrian Fernandez is in the pits and it just stalled the engine. Yeah, Paul, it's a tough one. He came in with a suspected flat tire. They engaged the clutch and it stopped dead. Now they get it restarted and Adrian is away for the Gallus team. Remember last year, he finished seventh here and Rick Gallus had three men in the top seven as Danny Sullivan won. Al Unser Jr., his driver at that time, was sixth. Fernandez started today in the sixth row, but some early disappointment now with an obstacle to try to overcome. Suspected flat, was it flat? Gary? Have not been able to see which one. Now I can see one that may be down, Paul. They're pulling them back over the wall and a lot of traffic here. Gary, we'll certainly, to find out. certainly Adrian Fernandez is one of the most charming young men around this business. Uh, he can get a sponsor, keep him, keep people interested in the sport. It's uh, around drivers like this that I think the future of the sport will revolve. Back at the front of the field, Al Unser Jr. being pursued by teammate Paul Tracy. Adrian Fernandez, I just want to throw a little bit on him. He's very good on the road circuits. Has an awful lot to learn on the ovals. He doesn't seem to be shining there, but get a track like this. He really is fast, has a lot of experience. First, Al Unser Jr. Second, Paul Tracy. Nigel Mansell, car number one, sits there in third in the Texaco Newman Haas Lola. Now, he's quite a story lately, and there was a strong indication that there was going to be a news conference concerning Nigel Mansell immediately after this race. And then that went away. Now the next rumor is, is that there's going to be a news conference held in London on Tuesday. That seems to be a real possibility. Look at him smoke the tires there. He's back fully on style. The strongest rumor, and we report it just as that, seems to be that there is a good chance that Nigel Mansell will drive in Formula One in the races that do not conflict with IndyCar. As we hear more on that, we'll certainly update you. Well, can I just do a little rumor, Paul, that I'm pretty sure is true. Nigel will be going with Formula One next year, at least. This goes on past year rumor. And none other than Michael Andretti is going to be driving this car. Rumor then, central in full tilt here. Well, you know, if you go to the Newman Haas trailer where you can buy uh, model cars and t-shirts and stuff, you can buy 143rd scale models of Mario's car and Nigel's car. Mario's car is $22 and Nigel's is only $20. And I asked, well, why is Mario's more expensive? And they said, well, it's his last year. I think they're going to add $2 to Nigel's model too, don't you? I don't know. I, I have some doubts. Nigel seems to be, from time to time, quite happy in Indy cars. He may drive some Formula One, but I think he'll keep his focus here. Al Unser Jr., though, is the focus of this race as he continues his lead. This Ford Fact is brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? In 1994, each of the chassis manufacturers have gone to the sequential gear shifting system. If we look inside Jimmy Vassar's Reynard, we can see that now it's just a simple pull back towards him to come up through the gears or this way to downshift. If we follow this cable to the back of the car, we come to a completely new transmission housing. Inside is encased the actual mechanism that they copied from a motorcycle transmission. What this means for a driver is that he can quickly come up through the gears, but on the downshifts, some drivers complain, oh, I used to like to skip gears. I used to like to go from sixth 
down to second gear. But the designers say, boy, am I glad they can't do that anymore. A lot of times they'd over rev the engine and that would be the end of the race. They can, however, come up through the gears very quickly. And we know that you win IndyCar races by standing on the gas, not standing on the brakes. Full course yellow is about to come out in the ITT Automotive Detroit Grand Prix. That uh, car on the left, the MyJack car 19, is Alessandro Zampedri, whom you may remember from the starting situations in Australia. But this time, not his problem. Dominic Dobson spun in front of him, and Zampedri just got caught, pulled out to the wall. Boy, Dominic made a bad boo-boo, left Zampedri with no place to go. Look at him, just collected him up cars were really getting together. It's lucky he didn't crawl up on top of the other car there, Paul. Ideal time for the pit stops. Al Unser Jr. on lap 21 takes advantage of the full course yellow that is now out and comes into the pits, as does Gujelmin, Villeneuve, Nigel Mansell. They have all come into the pits just in the few seconds between the start of that accident and the full course yellow coming out. And remember on the pit stops, first in, first out. The guys that can come in the quickest, go out and they're ahead in the serial scoring in the lineup. And that's so important on a track that it's so hard to pass on. Remember With too, there is a speed limit in the pits. So there's uh, every time that there's a mass uh, pouring into the pits, we know there's a chance that someone will exceed that limit and get a black flag. But what it does is gives Nigel Mansell the lead. Newman Haas got him out ahead of everyone else as they came into the pits. And now he looks for the pace car to pick up the pace car under the full course yellow. Let's. Uh, Let's update in a few minutes uh, the Mike Cross situation. He has uh, now been thoroughly checked over. In a moment, we'll be able to talk with him. Jack Arruda is pursuing him. In the meantime, we'll go to Gary Gerald. Paul, you mentioned that that race coming out of the pits was won by the Newman Haas team, but it was very close with Jacques Villeneuve. They nearly touched wheels as they exited pit road and got out onto the race circuit. Neither man willing to back off. Mansell ended up with the advantage, but the young rookie from Canada was sensational, and he is just a pit or two in front of Mansell coming out. It was very hairy down here. So Nigel Mansell, without question, someone to watch this weekend, started on the pole, was soon passed, by Al Unser Jr. And uh, then under these pit stops, the scoring's been somewhat scrambled. For the moment, uh, you see the two car of Fittipaldi sitting just in front of him. Fittipaldi has made a stop as well. We'll wait until they come past the start finish line again and we'll sort out the scoring totally. But right now, Al Unser Jr. is lined up just ahead of Mario. And then as you look back through the field, there's the two car of Fittipaldi and Nigel Mansell. So it's Bian Lunzer that comes to the front of the field when we are ready to go back to green flag racing. After this message and a word from our ABC stations. Brought to you by Wendy's. After 25 years, quality is still our recipe. Goodyear, number one in tires. Valvoline, people who know use Valvoline. And American Honda, who's been making quality cars in America for the past 11 years. Down below, they're still behind the pace car in a full course yellow. Arranged this way, Unser Jr., then Mario Andretti, then Paul Tracy, then Brian Herta, Emerson Fittipaldi, Nigel Mansell is in sixth position. Uh, actually sitting behind the pace car. Fittipaldi is up just a bit on that. Let's go to Jackaroo. But we're with the man that participated in the first full course caution of the afternoon, Mike Groff. First of all, Mike, we know you're okay, but what was the condition of the car? What happened? Uh, the car was actually okay. We went into the tires, unfortunately. That's not the way that we like to get on TV here, but um, uh, I think the Motorola car was poised for some good running today. But um, we had some problems with the brakes. I noticed it on the first turn. The front's locked up big time. And I went into turn three, and the car just went straight on. We carried on, and the car... Uh, Progressively, the brakes locked more and more. Now they can't even tow the car, so we had a, we had a mechanical problem. At the drivers' meeting this morning, they talked about some of the improvements here at Detroit, namely runoff areas. Did that help you today? No question about it. I, I think uh, the organizers of this race and car did a great job getting the tires up. Uh, like I said, it's not. I, I hate to be the one talking about it, but it's great that they're up. Uh, we're going to look into what our problem was there, and uh, we'll be back for Portland. Well, thanks for stopping by. And let's check in with the man that was participating in the second full course caution. He's with our own Gary Gerald right now. Gary. Jack, that's Dominic Dobson, and he made his way back across the racetrack. Dominic, tell us what happened back there in that traffic situation. 
Well, the PacWest car had been running fairly well. You know, it's been a long weekend for us. We didn't qualify well. We'd moved up, but I believe I picked up some debris and punctured a rear tire. And the car was getting looser and looser, and I think it was going down. I just lost it here in turn one. And uh, I didn't contact too hard, but San Pedro was behind me. There was nowhere for him to go, and he ended up slamming into me. So, uh, unfortunately, put us both out. Sad way to end the day. Yeah, I know, and you said it had been tough to qualify. Last weekend, it was such a great qualifying effort. You were up there in the third row in Milwaukee. Yeah, we did. We had a great qualifying on the mile oval, and uh, I just want to thank my team. They worked very hard, and hopefully we can get uh, four good cars ready and uh, go to Portland next weekend. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you. Paul? All right, let's reset this a little bit for you. We're under our second full course caution of the day. This one when the man you just saw, Dominic Dobson, spun in front of Alessandro Zampedri. We're going to let you look through the entire field here, led behind the PPG pace car by Al Unser Jr., then Mario Andretti. 23 of the 28 cars that started are still on the same lap with the leader. And uh, although Nigel was the pole sitter here last year, he never led. He did lead the first laps here today, now sits back in sixth position. And Brian Herta, who started 18th, is now in fourth position. But neither Brian Herta nor Mario Andretti, who sits in second position, have stopped for their first pit stop of the day. So now we're beginning to see even more of the tactics play out here. Alan Sir Jr., Mario Andretti, Paul Tracy, Brian Herta, and Emerson Fittipaldi are at the lead of the group behind the pace car in that order for the race. And there you see the rest of them, Bill Neff, Robbie Gordon, Teo Fabi, Mauricio Guzelmi. Of course, if Mario's plan is to come in just before the track goes back to green, it'll put him completely behind all these other cars in a very bad position. So my guess on Mario is, is that he's going to go on hope for another yellow flag. Some races, they just gamble on it. Sometimes they get them. It'd be a big gamble, though, Paul. We take a look at the race summary at the conclusion of 24 laps with uh, you know, more cars out here in the early going than we had in last week's run at Milwaukee, which was spectacular in terms of mechanical achievement as well as racing with only one car failing before the end of the run itself, though it was shortened by only nine laps. Now, as the pace car works its way off the track, they head for the green flag once again. Led by Al Hunter Jr., the green comes out. Myra Andretti is right behind him. But remember, Mario has not yet stopped. And watch Paul Tracy. Mario's light on fuel. Tracy is heavy. Now watch this there. Pretty easy to pass. Tracy went right by Mario. This is the reason I think Mario's wanting to stay out is so he can get another yellow and always stay up near the front. Fittipaldi just ahead of Nigel Mansell. Fittipaldi is fifth. Bobby, you made the point at the beginning that passing was going to require an act of bravery, but we have seen a lot of clear passing. And I wonder, last year, there was a lot of talk about blocking on this track. I think no one is blocking, and the racing is much better for it. So far right now, Stan, what we're seeing is clear passing by the Penske cars. We've not seen a clear pass by any other car. It would appear to me like the three Penske cars are out handling the other one pretty hard so far. Herter is around Mario Andretti as well, and now Fittipaldi lining up behind Mario just ahead here. You've got the glimpse from Nigel Mansell's onboard camera. Now you see the three of them lying just ahead. Emerson Fittipaldi just in front, and that car number six, of course, is Mario, with Emerson looking for all the room he can find, and Brian Herta and A.J. Foyt's number 14 just ahead of that. He'd like to put a little pressure on Mario right there. That's the... The sex car right there with a red letter on it, but right behind Ammo is none other than Nigel Mansell, so he's just afraid to get too far out of whack because Mansell will get him right away. Brian Herter runs in third now. The car is very light as uh, they have not made their stop for fuel, and both Mario Andretti and Brian Herter have carried the car 26 laps since their last stop, which is <laughs> actually not the last stop, the start of the race. There goes Fittipaldi. You can watch Nigel working up on him, getting closer. But Emo needs to move on ahead, but he's having a little problem getting any more speed out of his car. He doesn't seem to be handling quite as good as like little Alan Tracy, I thought. But this shot offers a superb comparison between the Penske car just ahead of Nigel Mansell with an Ilmore engine and Nigel Mansell with his Lola Ford. So watching Nigel Mansell as he pursues Emerson Fittipaldi. He moves right up on him in the tight turns, which is natural. Long straightaways, they move away a little bit. 
the sheer turns. difficulty of driving these cars is apparent from these onboard cameras because you see the number of shifts they have to make but also the number of small changes to the steering wheel and you see the barriers run from side to side the need for absolute precision and also for looking ahead if the car if it's two cars up gets in trouble then you have to know about it you can't just focus on the road or the car right in front of you riding with nigel mansell from time to time, a little break up on the signal from, him, from the camera. Look, though, Nigel, who started on the pole, has fallen steadily backwards here on the 27th lap, sits in sixth place. He actually didn't come out of the pits too fast. Their pit stop was a little bit slow. He lost a lot of positions right there, Paul. He also knows that he must, if he's going to mount a championship effort, he knows he must succeed today and that he must succeed on road courses. Mansell still looking for any opportunity on Fittipaldi. And that's where the battle lies. Mario, then Fittipaldi, then Mansell, then Villeneuve, then Gordon. Running from fourth back through the field. In fact, from fourth black back, they are lined up tightly together. You get a good glimpse of that right there. Fittipaldi, the only two-time winner of this race in the race. Very tough customer here. Very confident this morning as I saw him signing autographs, walking around with Emerson. You can tell when he's confident because he shows himself to the public. He's out around. He was confident this morning. The front of the field, it remains. Al Unser Jr. and Paul Tracy, they are not in contest with one another right now. On board now with Scott Goodyear, who runs in 14th place, just ahead of him on the course. From time to time, you should get a gl glimpse of Stefan Johansson. Here's a boy that's had a lot of problems so far this year. He just not seemed to work too good with this team. He's ahead of the team, not too working too good with him, but really hasn't been very fast all year. He's come up from <coughs> qualifying position of 21st to run 14th now. Telemetry here from Delco Electronics. A little different display. Look at the lateral G's. The meter, the second one from the right. Tells you how much hold he's getting in the turn, how hard his head is pitching over. You can just imagine what that meter is doing. Right and left hand turn. Here's a man, of course, a Canadian who would love to succeed here. There are three Canadians in the race. Paul Tracy is the front running one at the moment. Jacques Villeneuve is in seventh he's the second running canadian and uh scott goodyear is the so to speak bringing up the rear scott goodyear's best finish here an eighth both in 90 and 91 of course driving for a different team at that time he would love to succeed in front of his countrymen of course anyone would but he's never been successful as you point out paul here so Scott Goodyear tries to pursue the rest of the field, which for the moment has strung out just a bit, with 29 of 77 laps complete and little Al leading. Coming up next here on ABC Sports, from Talladega Super Speedway, you want to see some great racing? It's the third challenge of the International Race of Champions. Let me tell you, it is one great run. And later today at 5.30, 4.30 Central, Golf's Golden Bear takes a look at the field and the course for this year's national championship. It's the U.S. Open Preview with Jack Nicklaus, all here on ABC Sports. And Nigel Mansell now on the move as he is strongly in pursuit of Emerson Fittipaldi has closed up to just behind him. He takes a run at him, he gets up there, works him real hard, and then he backs off. What he's doing is he's locking up his front brakes a little bit on some of the turns that he's like to, like, or like to pass him on. Look how close he is right now. Now he's starting another pressure run on him, Paul. So Mansell right in close competition now. Close contact, though Fittipaldi handling a little better through these corners. These shots from overhead give you a great idea, a good perspective of the closures under braking and then under acceleration. What he's doing is he wants to put the pressure. He's putting the pressure really hard on Emil. He wants him to feel the pressure. He wants Emil to make a little bit of a mistake. Obviously, Emil's car is not working as good as the two other Penske cars. Remember that when we have these great chopper shots like this, there is an optical effect that you have to take into consideration. 
when they seem to be further apart on the straight than they are at, in the slow turns, that's not because, necessarily because the car ahead is out accelerating or out speeding the other one. It's just that the time interval between the two cars is still the same, but that time interval is bigger. I mean, the distance interval is bigger on the straight than it is in a tight turn. So at the front, it remains Al Unser Jr., followed by Paul Tracy. But now we're beginning to see, I think, some, some tactics, some strategy develop in the pits. Gary Gerald, you can update that. Paul, indeed, I think we are. It is a long shot. It is a remote possibility. Because there's been so much yellow early, that has enabled Mario Andretti to stay on the track. Remember, when that last yellow came out, most of the leading teams came in and made a stop for fuel and tires. Mario's crew is electing to keep him out as long as possible. Because if they can get up anywhere around, say, lap 40, then they're past halfway through the race. And if there's more yellow in the future, this could possibly be a one-stop race for Mario Andretti. Admittedly, it's a long shot, but that's what they're gambling on right now. And I think there may be similar strategy at the other end of the pit road as we go to Jackaroo. Well, Gary, there is for young Brian Herta and A.J. Foyt's car, but it may have changed just one lap ago. He radioed in to A.J. Foyt, Brian did, that the engine began to cough. A.J. told me his plan was indeed to try and make it in this race on one stop. They're playing a little liar's poker now. They're waiting to see if Herta will elect to bring the car on the pit road this time around. We'll wait and get back to you if he does. Well, let's keep an eye here on the 14 car, Brian Herta. He currently runs third. Yes, that's very good for him. And also, if he's coughing now, it won't be because of fuel, Jack. It's going to be something else wrong because he's got to be able to go more than 20 laps without having a fuel problem. You see him there in the picture in the inset wearing glasses. He is so different from A.J. Foyt, his mentor. But this team loves him and has full confidence in him. It's a wonderful thing to find that A.J. has found someone that he can really work with a young man to bring along and make his own. So Brian Herta, Jack, has actually completed 34 laps, so he's gone a very long way. And here's the plan, uh, Bobby and Sam and, and Paul. They want to make it to the 38-lap window. The cough seems to have gone away. A.J. Foyt just growled to the crew, bring everything back over the wall. We're going to roll the dice. Well... We're looking for some action then in the pits, perhaps in the next four laps from both Mario Andretti and from Brian Herta. You got a glimpse of a car off to the side there for a moment. That was the 25 car of Marco Greco that just rolled. Oh, there it is, rolled to the side of the track, and Marco climbed out of the car. We'll try and find out what the problem was for you. Which only means it has a local yellow. And incidentally, there's Brian Hurt again going for what we know to be a now one-stop race with A.J. Foyt making the decision. But a lot of races over the years have been won this way. The other guys that have to make two stops, if they don't have a lot of luck or a lot of distance on them, you can really get bit by something like this when you have two different game plans. So it's Brian Herta. A.J. Foyt may have just signaled one more lap for Brian and Mario Andretti that are the two question marks. In fact, there is A.J. Foyt's crew beginning to lay out tires and get the fuel hoses in position in anticipation of a stop at the conclusion of this lap for that car, the 14 car of Brian Herta. We knew that sooner or later Brian Herta would do well this year, but the idea that this team has gelled so quickly to put him in a position to maybe be on the podium is incredible. I know this gamble has to pay off. It's a long shot to be sure, but we are watching Brian Herta in the forefront of this race, and it's very exciting. And when you talk a guy who has race savvy, none other than A.J. Foyt, he can figure out tactics so fast. He did it for so many years in the cockpit. Now he almost has leisure time in the pits trying to do it. You know, he's in third place and, and absolutely running good. There's A.J. Foyt right there. And, you know, it's really something that you take a new team, put it together, no experience for Brian Herta, and have him in third already. A.J. Foyt talking to his driver while we wait for that potential stop. Let's go to Gary Gerald. And a quick update on Marco Greco. You said he stopped and was out of the car. We're getting a report from the crew of gearbox problems. We also are experiencing scattered drops of moisture out of one of these dark clouds passing overhead. And a third note, Paul, we expect Mario perhaps within the next three laps. Well, Mario Andretti and Brian Herta have now completed their 36th lap without yet refueling. Alan Jr. has completed 36 as the leader of the race, but it's been only 15 laps since he was in the pit. So here is a wonderful piece of strategy being played on Belle Isle in Detroit. Brian Herta, of course, majoring in economics at Ohio State, but he grasps the reality of what's happening here, and I'm sure he's short-shifting that car a little bit, making sure that he does get to the pits. 
not using any more fuel than he absolutely has to. They're 36 laps, they need 40. They get around 40, 39 or 40. What's a one-stop race for them? 77 laps, the total distance here. Scheduled as A.J. Foyt somewhat nervously looks on. Remember, this is a strategy that he's played here before on Belle Isle. A.J.'s car was second with Robbie Gordon at the wheel on the last lap in 1993. At that time, though, Robbie spun out. Look at A.J. as he talks to his driver, and Robbie Gordon is in the pitch, Jack. Brian Herta, 12 months ago at this very same racetrack, captured an Indy Lights race. He is now at the wheel with the legendary A.J. Foyt's number 14, takes some liquid. They are going to make a wing adjustment. They've gone down, believe it or not, Bobby Answer, two turns on the upper right-hand wing. 14.5 seconds there away. They say they're going to still try and make it a one-stop race. So he comes in on lap 37. Boy, I got to be careful around AJ for that mistake, don't I? Well, you know, lap 37 is going to put him a little bit close. They're counting on and hoping they get about at least one yellow to make it their guaranteed one-stop race. Further update, Jack. Well, Bobby, they had wanted to try and make it to lap 40, as you surmised, but Rob, but actually Brian Herta had a problem the last lap out. He brushed the wall. It kind of panicked him a little bit, and A.J. said, okay, bring it in. Jack, you mentioned his success here in Indy Lights last year when he won the race. Of course, he went on to win the Indy Lights championship. So this is a very savvy driver and also a driver that is an example of how that Indy Lights feeder system works to bring great young drivers into IndyCar competition. All right, so Brian Herta comes back out in the action, but he falls to 14th during the stop. That makes the next observation this fellow here, Mario Andretti, who on lap 38 heads into the pits. Gary Gerald's right there. They tried to nurse it as far as they possibly could. He is the last man to come in for pit service today. They didn't get the lap 40. Mario and his Arrivederci Mario Tour. They've named turn one here on Belle Isle in his honor. Everything looking routine. Flipping the throttle off the jack and rolling 14.3 seconds. So the question, Bobby Unser, let's just try this. There were three laps nearly six miles before the green flag, then Mario Andretti and Brian Herta carry it to at least the 38th lap of a race in which there are 77 laps scheduled. Why can neither one of those drivers make it to the end? I would think that they could. Well, they can, but they're gonna have to keep short shifting. Now, if they were to, for example, get a yellow right now, Paul, they could go ahead and run the cars hard the rest of the time. But right now, in order to know that he's not going to pick up air or lose the fuel pressure, he's going to have to short shift, run a slower speed. This is going to hurt him. And it's questionable. Is it worth it? Or is it better to go really hard the whole race and make two stops? Obviously, it's different people's different game plans. Well, of course, the fuel mixture can be adjusted as well. And obviously, you would run it at a setting which gave you as much mileage as possible. But when you do that, you lose power. It all costs speed that way, Sam. Yeah. Of course, with those two stops, the top of the order changes. Allenser Jr. is still leading, followed by Paul Tracy. Emerson Fittipaldi up to third. Then Nigel Mansell, Jacques Villeneuve, and Robbie Gordon. We'll be back. Motive Detroit Grand Prix looking down on the chorus from one of America's most enduring images, the Goodyear blimp. It's overhead, giving us an aerial view of the course here on Belle Isle. And on that course, it is Al Unser Jr. that runs in the lead, followed by his two teammates, Paul Tracy and Emerson Fittipaldi. Nigel Mansell sits in fourth place, and here is Michael Andretti. At the start of the show, we discussed his needs to get up to the front of the field. Well, he's come up some as he rides in 10th, having started in 17th position. And just ahead of him is Bobby Ray Hall and Mauricio Guzelmi. You know, this camera shot, I think, is so unique. It's mounted on the edge of his wing, on the end of it. And if you look there where it says Cracker Jack right there, that's the air scoop. You watch the tire going up and down. Watch how close the car, or excuse me, how the car is so steady. Look at the tire go up and down. The car literally doesn't move. Now, this is a good shot. That's the air scoop for the rear brakes on the right air side. Air scoop for the rear brakes. It has some in the front brakes that do the same. We just don't see them quite as well. And we had the same shot last week at Milwaukee, but that scoop was missing. You don't need the brakes cooled as well on ovals as you do on road courses. So that's something new on the car. And a drop of moisture on the lens. They mentioned earlier that there was an occasional sprinkle in the pits. 
And that could indicate that one of those clouds is passing over again, and that too could have a massive impact on this race. It certainly could, but you can see, look at that beautiful sky up there with the clouds. There's not too many really bad thunderheads, just little ones that are going over occasionally. I think it's gonna be limited to that, Paul. Only takes one. Look here, as he goes through the corners, watch the roll of the chassis, which you can see. If you lay the chassis as he rolls out, he makes that right-hander, the chassis rolls out to the left. And there's very little actual roll in these chassis. They sit basically flat, but you can see better from our camera position with the cars than you can by watching the cars run on the racetrack. Well, exactly, Bobby. Compared to a passenger car, there's only a fraction of the roll. I mean, as you look for it there, and you try to see the body leaning, you really can't. The reason for that is they're trying to keep the underside of the road a car as parallel to the road as possible so that the venturis of the ground effect system work as well as they possibly can if you watch the cars going right there now sam you don't see the tire moving up and down as compared to the chassis but as soon as we put the camera on it show you how nice the camera will show us bobby ray hall with goose mean just ahead of him you can see that uh, for the time being, Ray Hall is not in that close a contact. Let me just say, I think Ray Hall is one of the finest drivers in the business right now. Look at this perfectly executed pass by little Al diving down inside Buddy's ear. So Al Unser Jr. still at the top of the field. Paul Tracy chases, followed by Fittipaldi. Nigel Mansell is fourth. Jacques Villeneuve, young man with one terrific season under his belt as a rookie in the IndyCars currently sits in fifth place. That is a team, the Forsyth Green operation, with this new driver. They had him, of course, as a driver in the Atlantics last year. They've really come together so well, and they've been so strong all year. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, we were just checking with Barry Green, who is the co-owner of this team, and, of course, such a great fixture in IndyCar racing for so many years. And He's been so full of pride over the performance of the team and the young driver. We asked him how the car had been responding since that first stop. He says, we're hanging on with a big grin. They know that Robbie Gordon is lurking close by, but they were very proud of their pit stop that gained them a couple of positions into the top five. There gives you the interval back to Villeneuve. Just behind him, of course, is Robbie Gordon. Nice little fight here right now. These well, are two you, you, hot young chargers, and uh, it's good to see them racing together. Could provide some action. And you can certainly see the different lines. Oh, oh. Mario's off course. Off course and into the tire barriers. His last race at Detroit, but remember, they got Mike Groff out of the barriers and got him going. You can't tell how much damage might exist to the front of the car, but the fact that he's in so deeply, especially with the left side, there may be some damage there. It's so easy. It's going to damage the wings for sure, and sometimes maybe the suspension like it did on Mike Groff, but maybe it didn't hurt very much. You know, it's so easy to get into the tires here on a course like this. I'm sure we can see his front wings have been hurt quite a bit there because you can see the tires wrapped around it. They're really good. So it's not good news for Mario. Another issue is, is the car stalled and how tough will it be to get it going again? Because if the damage is superficial, he could make it back to the pits and get a new nose cone. Trouble is, look at the time that's being lost. And look at the skid marks. He just came straight off the corner on the exit, Bobby. Yes, he did. But that's also could have been from oil that somebody dropped on the road or there could have been another car that he was lapping that was having a bit of a problem. That's very often what happens in a track like this. Well, remember last year, Bobby, they, they really had just a single groove to run in by this part of the race because the tires had worn so much the rest of the track was what we call marbles and uh, this year it's better the tire compound is different for this race than it was last year it's a little bit harder but even so by this point in the race if you get off the line very much you can get in trouble well, mario sat there so long that he's just pretty much out of the race right now even if he gets back in he's totally out of contention he's hung up with the tires too hard Ford Electronics on board, Robbie Gordon's car. Boy, they've done a nice job with this, too, giving us the gear as well. The report, of course, from the IndyCar safety team, we could pretty much tell Mario Andretti is not injured in that accident. You'll see him coming up on the left. Well, gone. <laughs> Just watch a speedometer where it says MPH over there. Watch how fast these cars accelerate. They'll go from almost nothing into way over 100 miles an hour and just almost Whoa. nothing flat. Look at this fight with Bill Nook. They continue to battle for fifth place. Two young guys that really have a lot to prove. Both in their mid-20s. Jock Vilneff having his rookie year. Robbie Gordon, of course, his third year. Mario is staying in with that car. That was our broadcast booth that just flashed by on the left there. Right on the edge of the course. A terrific view. And they've got Mario started again. 
We'll look, look at, at the car for damage. Look at that car. It's still basically together. Now, how in the world could you have a wreck like that and not have any more problems? Look at the wings are still on it. The wings are still there. It's amazing what those tires will do to cushion a, a crash. You know, for years, barriers with no protection. That would have normally been hitting a uh, cement wall or something like that would be a hundred thousand dollar wreck. Really you know, what, easy. A, what a simple solution, the used tires. And they band them together. If you don't band them together with the steel straps, they don't work. Let's go up forward now, Nigel Mansell, as he chases Fittipaldi. Jack Aroot, do you have an addition? Paul, just goes to show you the cooperation. At last year's driver's meeting at this race, the drivers brought up a point about in the runoff areas, if they could add more rows of tires, they thought they could slow the cars down with less damage. That's what Wally Dallenbach, Kirk Russell, and the rest of them did. And there you see it. Saved $100,000 for Mario Andretti. And so simply, too. Mansell now in pursuit of Fittipaldi. This is a fight for third. But earlier, Mansell, I noticed, was having trouble with his right front wheel locking up under braking. Now, if he's going to get by Emerson, it's probably going to be under braking, and yet he is not able really to brake that deep. It's going to be interesting to see if he's able to get by exactly what tactic he uses. Now, Sammy pushes on him really hard, just as he did earlier. Then he backs off a little bit, lets Emo have a little breather. What it is, still the same old deal. He's trying to worry him to death before he takes a real hard run at it. The Mansell in pursuit. Allenser Jr. leads Paul Tracy by six seconds, so no contest at the front of the field. We'll continue to watch Fittipaldi and Mansell. Now they have Mark Smith just ahead of them. This could be the other thing that Mansell waits for which is a slower car, and use him for a billiard shot. Yes, that's a, that's what I started to mention, Paul. You got it just before I did. Look at Mansell now. He's right on fit of Paul's tail. This is when he's got to do it, because if he can lock Emmo into a certain place behind Mark Smith, he gets by him really easy. Yeah, Mark Smith didn't want any part of that. Well, we're talking about sportsmanship here, though. He saw who was behind him. Mark Smith just intentionally pulled right over. It wasn't a let by. He just deliberately made sure the track was clear for these two men. Look ahead to Fittipaldi's car. From time to time on a gear change, you can see a flash of flame from the exhaust. The exhaust is just behind the half shafts extending out to the two rear wheels. That's, that's caused by when you shift, the fuel keeps getting in the turbocharger. The turbocharger running like 1,800. Oh, and Fernandez into the wall. He moves around. Apparently, he's okay, though the right rear of the car looks like it suffered some heavy damage. This time, the cash register is ringing. He has hurt the car. Again, the IndyCar safety crews are right there, but this is a very precarious position. A lot of warning before they get there. The flagman around here really give the drivers a lot of warning so they don't get hit by another car. Little Al comes in for a stop, Jack. Scheduled stop for Al Unser Jr. Number 31, as you said, Al Jr. trying to change history by making it a winning car number in IndyCar competition. They are going to make, gentlemen, no changes on the car. They have completed the fueling. That's what they want to make sure they get a full load. They do in 13 in 15.0 seconds jack of course you mentioned that winning streak this would be his fourth consecutive win if he can manage it only one other person has done that in recent history and that is himself he had a winning streak four in a row back in 1990. as little al comes up to speed paul tracy takes over the lead of the race little al stopped on the 49th lap but here's a change. The yellow comes out. So Al Unser Jr., if he could have held off for a lap, would have made the stop under yellow. Yes, but it is going to hurt him too bad, Paul, because the other guys like Paul Tracy are going to have to go in. And this is going to turn out to be one of those situations where first in, first out. So he, she should end up being up near the front with the exception of the ones that are on, out of phase on his pit That's stop. what I was going to ask yeah. you. This is going to help those guys immensely. It'll help them immensely right now. Men like Brian Herter. Now Mario, of course, with his incident, has dropped back through the field and uh, is not in competition for the lead of the race in any way. In fact, he's not in the top 20. They wait for Paul Tracy and Emerson Fittipaldi. There's Fittipaldi, Jack. 
the teammates come together. Now, Emerson Fittipaldi was complaining about a slight push, so we'll wait to see if the crew will make any major changes. Paul Tracy is off and away as we continue to watch the service on Nigel Mansell's car as well. A very busy time in a full course yellow. Mansell continuing his work. Meanwhile, further up pit road, Emerson Fittipaldi and Paul Tracy have completed their work while Robbie Gordon continues to get his service in his Valvoline machine. Whoa, Fittipaldi on the roll comes out right alongside of Mansell. Mansell got scored with the lead of the lap because he's pitted on the other side of the line. Let's go to Gary. Well, Paul, that situation resulted when Mansell started to accelerate out of the pits just as Jack Villeneuve, two pits ahead, pulled in. They came within inches of hitting each other. Villeneuve stopped on a dime. Mansell hammered it and got out of there. He left rubber streaks all the way down pit road as he accelerated. But again, they were just inches from disaster. Similar thing almost happened between Michael Andretti and Teo Fabi as they came out of the pits. Of course, a lot of times when a driver leaves the pits, if he can do it in somewhat of a safe manner, he would love to block the guy coming out behind him because remember it's so hard to pass if you get out of the pits first boy that's a big game bobby there are a lot of rules maybe you're not the guy i should be asking this question come to think of it but let me try it there are a lot of rules on the conduct of the cars on the course we're going to take a look first at the adrian fernandez situation and what brought out this full course yellow he obviously went in there, got very loose. You could see his rear end was coming around, even though we couldn't see a bunch of it. You could see his rear end coming around. He got loose and just out to the fence, and Kurt Bam. Reminds you of Dominic end. Dobson. Same sort of incident. Nigel Mansell in the pits. This is that. See, that's where he had to dart over as Villeneuve came through. And he lost momentum, of course, which allowed Fittipaldi to get back in the exact position he was before they both hit it. All right, Bobby, so here is my question. Is there any rule regarding that? Does one person have a right of way over the other? Absolutely not. There, there has never been a rule about that, and they just, it's just like root hog or die. Get out the best way you can. And if you can block somebody without creating an unsafe situation, you do it. Now, in this particular place with Mangel, look at the tires. He's captured. He needs to go straight. He looked in his rearview mirror. He's got Emil coming down there. He's got a problem. He has to slow down, stop, and there goes Emil right by there. He was just trapped in a situation there. It's so like a fun. We are still under full course yellow while they get this car, that of Adrian Fernandez, off the course. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Still under a full course yellow, the third of the day here in the ITT Automotive Detroit Grand Prix as the rest of the field is now beginning to close up behind Al Unser Jr. and the PPG pace car. Here is the order behind the pace car. Unser Jr., Paul Tracy, Emerson Fittipaldi, Nigel Mansell. Now tonight, all family fun with America's Funniest Hour, followed by Lois and Clark. And then before Melrose, Heather Locklear, Heated Up Dynasty. Now she's back with Joan Collins, Linda Evans, and John Forsythe. Dynasty, the reunion, tonight here on ABC. So the third full course yellow of the day taking the speed uh, down to 85 miles an hour. Steve Johnson, or Stevie Johnson, we call him, we call Stephan Johansson <laughs> Stevie Johnson when we're not on the air. Now we've done it on the air and so I quit. Stephan Johansson is uh, pulled off the course, climbed out of the car and his day uh, apparently is over. We'll try to keep track of him and find out what that problem was. Bobby. And his happened under the yellow flag when he's going slow, so Lord only knows what went wrong with him. But, you know, the thing that is interesting is the drivers and teams that planned their one-stop race or one-stop pit stop for the race have all failed now. All the guys that have planned a two-stop race are the ones that are out in front. Our EDS scoring showing us that 12 cars still remain on the lead lap. Led, of course, by Alan Sir Jr. Now, take a look at this. This was Nigel as he was coming out. He was already at the point we picked it up there around Villeneuve. Now, let's take a look. This is an entirely different view of that same stop and shows you how he got trapped. Watch for Villeneuve. Whoa. Yeah. Split second stuff. You know, out on the track, you fall into sort of a rhythm. But in the pits, that never happens. And the one thing that we didn't see is those right ahead. Look at the tires right out in front of him. That's what was causing the problem. Somebody else's tires for somebody else's pit stop. That's what caused the first part. And then comes by Emerson after the Bellevue thing. 
So Nigel was like the look civic center again. down in look, L.A. Look, too, at the frustration on the crew when they realize what's happened here. Yeah, because they know they've lost the spot to uh, Fittipaldi. And, and it was going to be so hard for Nigel to get by him on the track, and they had it done in the pit. So that's a doubly frustrating thing. Dallin is the one that really did a good job on that. He knew when to stop and not press the issue anymore, and that saved the whole thing. Let's go to Gary. Green, Barry Green is watching anxiously for a restart on the green flag. He must communicate to Villeneuve. Was your heart in your throat when he had to jump on the binders and Mansell came rocketing out of there? Yeah, it was all pretty hectic. A lot of cars in and out, you know, and we were uh, encouraging him to get down here. Um, but uh, it was a, a good call. I mean, he saved us. Uh, we just uh, got a little bit crossed up there. Okay, well, let's get back. He's watching green here, Gary. Watching anxiously for that green, as we do. Thank Gary, you, Gary. Gary, of course, uh, Villeneuve concentrates so hard on his driving, he actually comes out from the pits, uh, I mean, from where the uh, transporters are, with his helmet on. He comes out fully ready to drive, gets in the car, and goes. Sam, it's something that we've not seen. In Indianapolis, it was amazing because it was at least a half hour before drivers got in the cars. He left Gasoline Alley with that helmet in place. He says it helps him focus. He's done it here this weekend. I think I hear engines escalating. As they throttle up, the green flag comes out once again on the 53rd lap with Al Unser Jr. leading the field around. Let's give you the order at the front. Unser Jr. followed by Tracy, followed by Fittipaldi, Mansell, Gordon, Tail Fabi, Michael Andretti, Bobby Rahal, Chuck Villeneuve, and then, of course, Guzelmin. Now watch there, though. You got little Al in the 31 cart, Paul Tracy, right behind him. Now they've got a lot of traffic that is down almost a lap or whatever in front of them. This is where the problems are going to come. Well, just as the race ended last week at Milwaukee, the Penske cars are running one, two, three, and you wonder, is that good for the sport that one team is so dominating it? I don't think it matters a bit because you realize these drivers are racing each other. This is not formation. Whoa! Stuff. Case in point, gentlemen. Right there. He got tagged. Allen Sir Jr. tagged from behind. Paul Tracy was the culprit. And that sent him off into the barrier. There goes the streak of four consecutive wins. And he is well, very maybe, mad. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Little Al has incredible luck. This is the guy that one is going to have to worry about when Little Al gets a hold of Look him. Look at the tire mark on the front of Tracy's nose. This Little Al's going to be very upset over that one. This is the third consecutive year that Tracy has seized the lead on this track. They're closing on Vassar. Now watch the car on the left. Tracy's coming up, went right down, booted little Al, booted him off, and there he goes into the tires. Nothing little Al could do, plus he didn't expect it to happen. I don't think that's going to be a very popular move within the team. Uh, do you, Bobby? Well, it won't be. It, two cars on the same team, Sam, unfortunately have to be a little bit more careful than they would be if they were competitors on different teams. The good news seemed to be that little Al's car looked to be fairly intact. That, watch it as it passes through the barrier here. But obviously he's on the brakes, Paul, so hard he's probably got the engine killed on the thing right yeah, there. There he is. Let's yeah. take a look at the wings and everything. He looks to be in pretty good shape. We've seen those tires perform miracles when you run into them. It's hard to believe. I don't see a problem there. Do you, Bobby? I really don't. I see no problem. Of course, this we don't know about the finite parts of the steering, but he looks like he's in pretty good shape. I this didn't is hit when that a driver, driver has to really pull himself together emotionally, too. I wouldn't be surprised if Little Al's pretty angry right now. He's got to steady himself out. Ah, uh, Sam, that won't bother him. He's been a lot of wrecks before. The thing that's bothering him is he doesn't know whether his wings are pit or not yeah. right now, see? Let's go to the pits once again, Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, one of the things that Team Penske does, according to Richard Buck, is they go over, kind of like the way we do before a race, as far as what we think is going to happen, they go over all of the scenarios. They are waiting for Al Jr. to make his presence known on pit road, but they have already rehearsed a wing exchange earlier this week. They have the wing ready. Richard Buck has just received the word from Al Jr. that he wants his wings replaced. He'll be coming on to pit road on this circuit. Well, that's a surprise because there's nothing really obvious about the rings. Obviously, he's uncomfortable with it. And Nigel Mansell. Nigel Mansell finds the tires, and he unstraps and is ready to climb out. This looks like a repeat of last year. People having problems towards the end. Well, just exactly... Careful. Wow. Now, that's hard to do. I couldn't yeah. even do that. That's now. awesome. <laughs> that's he's an difficult. athlete and a half. That's difficult. So Nigel Mansell climbs out of his car and across the tires. 
Let's go to Jack Aroots. Well, Al Jr. has come in, and we're looking at the wings. Not a problem with the wings, gentlemen, other, on the, other than on the right side, one wing dip has been bent. One of the control arms is slightly bent. They tried to fix it manually. We're under full course yellow. This will give them the luxury, the Penske team, of if they want to, talking their way through whether they want to change the wing or not. They simply change the tires. More of a luxury because of this yellow, the fourth yellow of the day. This one because of Nigel Mansell, who was running with Fittipaldi. And it looks like he, well, he may not have tagged Fittipaldi, but it was close. Yeah, it looks like there's a real good chance he might have touched him a little bit, but he was certainly locked up and spun, trying to avoid him as best he could. Well, another way to find out is from this onboard camera. Mansell, of course, desperately needed the points from here. Now he probably won't get any. They're about two turns away from where it happened, so watch closely. Whoa. Got in trouble before he got Fittipaldi. Well, actually, Fittipaldi, for some reason, slowed down an awful lot, and that caused Nigel to have to slow down unexpected. He wasn't expected. And he wasn't expecting to have to break that hard that soon. As you can see, Nigel is back in the cockpit and ready to try it again. Let's look at this one more time, Sam. Well, obviously, he locked him up suddenly there before he hit Emerson. He was certainly not attempting a passing maneuver when that happened. I think Emerson should slow down unexpectedly. Well, because, because of the car no in front of Emerson, don't you think, Bobby? Yeah, they're yes, possibly. They're in, tra they're in slower traffic when they when they do this, and it looks like they that like Emo got out of the throttle as well, but very definitely Nigel got over in the wall. Let's go down to the pits. Remember, and there's no question. Well, there might I don't be a know. question. A chain have to reaction. Watch. Let's go down to Jack. Well, they call this gentleman the longest walk in sport, the walk that a driver has to make from his wounded car back to his pit area. Stefan, what was the problem with the machine? Well, what finally made me stop was the fifth gear broke, but I got punted out in the start, so I had to come in on the first lap to replace the right rear tire, which, of course, put us at the back of the field, so, you know, it's just one of those days. <laughs> it's been one of those years for you. You really had so much promise last year. What do you think the problem is? Is is there something you can pinpoint to maybe turn the team around, the Alumex team? No, uh, you know, I think I don't think there's anything that's wrong. I mean, you know, we started off pretty good with we're running a year old car and we ran fifth in the championship when we came to Indianapolis. We had a horrible race there, but that was just a setup problem more than anything. And then last week we ran pretty strong and then the engine broke which is you know one of those things and here the gear i mean fifth gear i mean when does, how many times does that happen it's just just one of those deals just bad luck and talking about some bad luck gentlemen let's update you as well on al unser jr the upper a arm is severely bent on the right side question is what they can do to fix the problem as we run down the laps here this afternoon and can they do it in time exactly jack al unser jr now runs in 10th place 58 laps of the 77 lap scheduled distance are complete. Paul Tracy now has the lead of the race. We'll be back. PT Automotive Detroit Grand Prix where Paul Tracy is our current leader as a result of that confrontation with Little Al. His teammate Emerson Fittipaldi sits in second place. Robbie Gordon started in 10th place is now up in third. Teo Fabi sits just behind him in the Pennzoil car in fourth position. Michael Andretti, who started 17th, is fifth. And Bobby Rahal, the Honda's working for him. Let's go to Gary. Nigel Mansell just pulling away from the pits here. He came in, left the engine running for some time. They took the front nose off, then they shut the engine down, got it replaced. Front wing's new, now fired up, and he is back out there. So he will try to get out there, possibly collect one, two, three points. Who knows? Still a very, very tough task. And remember, he won one other pole this year, Paul. That was on the streets of Australia. And then in the rain, he made a couple of mistakes with spins that cost him any opportunity for early season points. And now, with this problem, his uh, championship hopes of repeating looking real dim. But as Sam pointed out in the opening of the show, it's still early in this season. The three car, Paul Tracy has assumed the lead. We'll also be keeping track of that battle right there. Emerson Fittipaldi with Robbie Gordon just behind him. Teo Fabi and then Michael Andretti. As they begin to pick the pace up now, they'll be coming back to a green flag. Paul Tracy may win this race, but I believe he will arrive in the pits to a stony 
reception from the Penske uh, team. Remember, Little Al was put out of this race by his teammate Danny Sullivan last year, right toward the end. So history has just taken a, uh, it's repeated itself here. Scott Goodyear, the 40 car, wisely gets out of the way. He has a lap behind the leader. He sees that battle coming through. Good sportsmanship there. You need sportsmanship on this track because of the narrow confines. You have to give the other guy a chance. It's really quite a narrow track. You can watch as you watch the guys go around. Concrete on both sides, sometimes steel and concrete, but it generally is just a very narrow track. Robbie Gordon in a battle for second place with Emerson Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi just in front of his tire up there as they run along the river here, the water just over to the left. What Gordon has added this year to his arsenal of skills is patience. I've said this before, but you see, this race is a perfect example. He was mired down in fifth and sixth place throughout much of it. He made no mistakes. He came slowly up. Suddenly, he's battling for a position on the podium. And even though he's not making mistakes, Sam, he's still charging hard. Robbie Gordon is definitely one of the best newcomers that we've seen in a long time. And he's with a good team, and we're on board with him right there in the Valvoline Cummins car. And it's a good camera shot that we have. Paul Tracy is one and a half seconds ahead of Emerson Fittipaldi. So in just those few laps since the green, Tracy's been able to pull away just a bit. This is the battle on the course for second between Fittipaldi and Gordon. Dale Fabi has been held up by Scott Goodyear and is trying to get around as he runs in fourth place and would like to get back in this fight. You can certainly see a different groove that the different drivers take as you watch the cars go through those two sharp turns right in there. In traffic again, again second gear. Watch how much he tends to use it. He'll go up to top gear here, which in this case will be fifth, because on road courses they must mount the reverse gear. No driver likes to be under attack from a brash, young, hot driver behind. Emerson Fittipaldi knows that he needs to keep his distance ahead. He's fighting as hard right now as he possibly can to keep those several car lengths ahead of Gordon, because the minute he's only a car length or so ahead, then he has to worry about being passed. Right now he can drive his own race, Gordon drive his own race. But it is so much better to be the pursuer here. In Gordon's heart is the excitement of the chase. In Fittipaldi's is the fear of what's happening behind him. Except that Emma pulled away a little bit. He doesn't really have anybody. He doesn't have Robbie Gordon breathing right on him right now. He's definitely got a lot of room there for being a little bit more careful, Tim. That is true. He's up to over a second ahead uh, of Gordon right now. I think Emerson has been faster throughout the race. And we're seeing him able to pull away just a hair now. But what is a fantastic run here is that of Paul Tracy, who has now pulled out five seconds ahead of Fittipaldi and has done that in two laps. Tail Fabi is finally around Scott Goodyear, and Michael Andretti will be the next to uh, come up and try Goodyear in the order of the race itself. Well, Tracy, of course, won five races last year and is winless so far this year. It would get him off to a terrific mid-season start here if he could win this. But as I said, I don't think it'll be overly popular. So looking ahead to Tail Fabi, fourth would be Fabi's best finish since Long Beach in 93. We talked about the Canadians, of course. Here's Scott Goodyear, a Canadian. Now a Canadian is in the lead. If you look south from Belle Isle, it's an anomaly of uh, the relationship of Canada and the United States that you can actually see Canada to the south from this one place. Uh, and you know, that's why there's so many fans over here from Canada. It's really close by. These views from the Aerial Films helicopter occasionally will take that run along the backside. That's and looking west there over toward the uh, United States. Over to the right of this shot is east and Canada. Yeah, I was telling I was going to ask you, you say Canada's to the south or to the east? South and east. <laughs> oh, it is. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. All right. The idea of you two in a geography lesson. Is it's frightening, isn't scary. it? Yeah, I don't think I know. we know where we're going. North, no, no, north and south. Let's stay on racing. You can barely get through that. Michael Andretti here in the target car, you see right in the center of the screen, has shown this season that even when things do not go his way, he soldiers on. He's had a really tough time with this car from time to time. I know he almost threw his helmet in frustration on Friday. I saw him, I was standing right next to him. He managed to pull it back just in time, keep control of himself. Doesn't look like it's working too good right now, Sam. I can see it quivering quite a bit. That isn't like Michael. Well, well he runs but in fifth place. He exactly. wants to get around that car, the 40 car, the Budweiser car. It's got Goodyear in front of him so that he can get back in his fight with Tail Bobby. This is holding him up a little bit. 
Goodyear, this is not a battle for position. He's putting a lap on Goodyear. Goodyear runs 11th right now. Bottom half of the top 10, Ray Hall in 6th. Build up. He runs 7th, followed by Guzman 8th. Brian Herdick is 9th. That gamble didn't pay off. Decisive. And Ellenser Jr. is 10th. Decisively faster was Michael up through those very fast turns. Here comes Michael. And here comes Ray Hall. Well, Goodyear absolutely is letting him get by. He realizes that he's down. He's letting him get by, which is good sportsmanship and is what you should do if you're down a lap. Yeah, but of course what happened there is Bobby Rahal was able to come up and get in direct contact with Michael Andretti. So this is now what would have been a battle between Michael and Tail for fourth has become a battle between Michael and Rahal for fifth. And a battle between a Ford engine in Michael Andretti's car and a Honda engine in Bobby Rahal's car. This is the recently modified Honda that we talked about. Different ignition timing, different exhaust sound, more torque than it had last week at Milwaukee when it had a pretty good run. Development year for Honda. They are getting better with every race. The target car is Michael Andretti, the Miller car, of course, Rahal. Jack Rue, you have something for us? And Ray Hall will have a tough time getting around Michael. He may be able to get it done, but Michael will definitely make him work for it. There Nobody is traffic. Nobody drives harder than Michael does. True, but there is traffic ahead. Michael's under a lot of pressure at this point. Let's try Jack Aroot again. Hello, Paul. There we go. Mike was closed. That's the problem with me if I can't talk when you don't hear me. I wanted to update you on the situation with A.J. Foyt and Brian Hurtis car. The gamble didn't pay off for one major reason. During that last long caution period, full course yellow, Brian made a typical rookie mistake. He was unable to close up quick enough and found himself mired back in 11th spot. A.J. figuring that discretion was the better part of valor, brought him in for a splash and go just before they went back to green flag racing. So A.J. Foyt still playing a strategy there as we continue to watch this battle for fifth place, Bobby Rahal and Michael Andretti. At the front of the field, it is still Paul Tracy with now Nigel Mansell well down in the order back into the pits once again. We'll be back. Grand Prix, we watch the leader, Paul Tracy. He has a 10-second lead over second place Emerson Fittipaldi. Robbie Gordon is four seconds back behind Fittipaldi. Then the battle in this field develops between Teo Fabi, Michael Andretti, and Bobby Rahal. We take a look at the race summary at the conclusion of 66 laps. This is a 77-lap race. 83 miles an hour was the average speed then. It has come back up to 84 miles an hour since then. And the record in this race is 83 miles an hour. So despite four yellows, they are running at a record pace. Paul Tracy, car three, still at the front of the field. Is but we keep an eye on Nigel Mansell, who came in just a few moments ago and had his belts tightened down and now is back into the pits again, rolling very slowly toward Gary Gerald. Gary, do you have any idea why he is back in the pits once again? Don't have a clue this time, Paul. We just came down here. We were two pits away, and we await with the team. And uh, no, not in sight from our vantage point yet. The car's not going to make it. He's going to have yeah, to get Crew's on the run now, Bobby. They're headed toward the car. They've got him. The, uh, the, some of the officials have him, and then the crew will take over. He definitely has a dead engine. He doesn't have any power, so that's the reason he couldn't get down to you there, Gary. So Nigel Mansell sits by the side of the track and becomes no factor whatsoever in this race now as he falls steadily down through the field. The key player is Paul Tracy, car number three. Remember Nigel Mansell last year was trying to get around one of the safety vehicles and in doing so got pushed off of the line into the slippery part of the course and eventually into the barrier. The track conditions are much better though toward the end of this race than they were last year. I believe because of the harder compound that Goodyear brought to the race this year. Tracy is running without any traffic, clean air all the way, so he's able to really make time up on the second place. Look at there. How far back it is before you see anybody even in sight. There's Fittipaldi. 
Long and way back. Tracy picked up another two seconds out from Fittipaldi in just that last lap. He's now 12.3 seconds ahead of Fittipaldi. Last year when Tracy went on his mid-season tear, winning so many races there, it was after a third place. It was at Portland last year. He was third at Milwaukee last week. So there's something about a calm finish that seems to settle him down. Then he, then he gets hot. Paul Tracy is running the fastest laps of his race. In fact, his uh, fastest lap thus far was just three laps ago at 104.3 miles an hour. Nigel, of course, is in championship trouble being out of the race, but he can take some solace in the fact that uh, the leader of the championship, Alonzo Jr., has had, uh, you know, trouble as well and has been delayed. He's currently running just 10th. Back through the order, Robbie Gordon runs in third place. Teo Fabi is fourth, and this car, Michael Andretti, is in fifth place right now, trying to pursue Teo Fabi. Bobby Rahal is just behind Michael. You see how close behind Michael Andretti, Bobby Rahal is in that black and yellow car that we're now looking out over the nose of. Honda Power car with Rahal. Rahal almost never, ever makes a driving error. He's fast and he's very, very skilled. Let's go to the pits. Gary Gerald is with Nigel. Nigel has come out now with a helmet off. A motor problem ends up being the culprit, finally. Yeah, we, we've had an exciting day, haven't we, one thing and another, but uh, we're having a great day, sir, with Emerson, and uh, I think uh, maybe the back marker in front of him made him break a little early, and that's why I tagged his back, but uh, then we got going again, and but then the, I think uh, something's happened uh, with the engine, the throttle cable's either broken or something, but uh, it's not working too good at the moment. You got out of the car after the incident, then got back in. Then we saw you with a second pit stop securing the belt. Were you harnessed in to begin with? Yeah, I was, uh, partly. Uh, one of the belts was undone, and uh, I radio to the pit where were we, and they said 20th place, and it wasn't worth taking that risk for so many laps being out of the point, so we came in and put the other belt in, and then as it happens, we've had a mechanical problem anyway. It's got to be a huge disappointment because of this point situation when you look at where you are now comparison to the great success, particularly on the ovals at this point last year. Yeah, but it's been an exciting race and uh, I think it was very good up until we had a problem. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of racing still left in the season and the Newman Haas team works superbly. And they deserve better today, but that's motor racing. We've been in it a long time and we know that next week will be a new week. Any announcements about your racing future in the next few days? Uh, it's over at the moment. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Nigel. So Nigel Mansell, you just saw Teo Fabi come around. There comes the target car of Michael Andretti and the Miller car of Bobby Rahal. Now that is a battle for fourth place. Teo Fabi currently occupying that position. Rahal has worked everything he can do. He's gone low, high, used every groove he can use. He's cut across the curb, but he can't pull up on Michael. Now, he knows right there he only has five laps left. So, and look right behind, there's Bellinue. He's trying to get up into it. All of these guys are right together now. Both Michael Andretti and Jack Vilneff are driving Renard cars. And I talked to Adrian Renard, the owner and des chief designer for that uh, company, and he said he was disappointed in the way the teams did not work together. Uh, obviously, this is their first year in IndyCar racing. They really need to share information. He had hoped that there would be more inter-team spirit than there has been. Well, that isn't competition if you're giving the other guy your secrets. Maybe you better tell Renard it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Not in the United States, anyway. Fight here for eighth place. The Hollywood car is Mauricio Guzelmin, and Brian Herta is just behind him. Brian started 19th, now runs up, and does his fight with Mauricio Guzelmin. This is the closest fight on the course right now. Paul Tracy is still pulling away, but not nearly as fast as he was earlier. Guzelmin might have hoped for better from today. Remember, he started fifth and was running fifth and sixth in the early going. He's back right now in eight, with that very colorful car. You see it there. He's making a bid on the inside of young Scott Sharp, who's a lap or two behind. Now Sharp is running 14th, two laps behind. He's not a factor in this fight. Passing is a little bit harder right now also because the tires are worn down. The track is as slippery as it's been all day, probably a little bit worse, with no tires or light of fuel. Sometimes when the track gets slippery, a little heavy load of fuel makes the cars go faster. So that's the reason we're seeing passing so hard to do right now. This is exciting stuff, though, as Brian Herta is in an ideal position. Guzman is going to be bottled up behind the slower car of Scott Sharp, and we may see an effort by Herta to make a pass. Herta looks.
looking left and right, looking for an opportunity to close and pass Guzelman. Time running out. 73 laps completed by the leader, Paul Tracy. 77, the scheduled distance. We're also at the same time tracking another fight on the course, Bobby Rahal and Michael Andretti. This is the closest one at the moment, though. And the presence of Scott Sharp made the difference. Now we're going to come back up, take a look. We're on board with Bobby Rahal. Michael Andretti, fifth place, just ahead of him. He just isn't gaining on him. He's trying everything he can, but not gaining. Michael, on the other hand, is really trying hard. He's had problems with that car. Doesn't handle as good or run as good as it should. So he's just driving the heck out of it. But Paul Tracy in front. His teammate Emerson Fittipaldi in second, 13 seconds back. Then Robbie Gordon. Then Teo Fabi. Then this battle. Michael and Bobby Rahal. The championship implications, of course, of what's happened will still leave Alonzo Jr. leading the championship. But Emerson Fittipaldi will move up a good deal closer to him. Alonzo Jr. currently running in 10th place as he starts to close on the back end of Brian Herta. We'll keep that track for you as well. If little Al has that upper A arm bent the way, the, the way we got our report from the pits, he has to be very careful braking because as you brake, that's a part of the front end suspension that would be easy to fold right then, so he would know that. That's always a scary experience, isn't it, Bobby, when you're driving and you know that at any split second, some vital suspension part on your car may snap. Well, it's under braking, you have to brake so much here. Brakes are such an important thing, and to have the suspension already bent a little bit really makes it weak then. 75 laps complete for Paul Tracy. There's Mauricio Guzelman, Brian Herta just behind him, and Al Unser Jr. just behind Brian Herta. But Al fell, fell back to 10, and now he's closing on these two in their battle. It's another big day, of course, for the Penske team. Not quite the way it was in Milwaukee last week when they were 1-2-3, but still they have been the dominant team and their biggest opposition, which was Nigel Mansell. We just talked to him out of the race. I don't believe necessarily that the domination of a series by one team is bad for the series. It helps people that are not involved day to day with the racing to have a good idea of what's going on. Many teams that ran a big streak uh, like the Yankees and so on did not hurt the sports that they were involved in. White flag, one more lap to go, comes out for Paul Tracy. He runs alone, 12 seconds ahead of his teammate Emerson Fittipaldi. Bobby Unzer, Little Al, those are some pretty critical points positions sitting just in front of him, currently occupied by Guzmán and Herta. And, uh, you know, however hard that he would charge right now would determine, be determined by how much he thinks his front end is bent. We know the car's capable of doing it. But if he thinks he's got a problem, he can't brake hard, he can't take any chances. That's his problem. So run safe rather than risk the car just to grab a couple of extra points there. He's a smart young man. If he knows he's got a problem, and I know that Roger Penske would be telling him what he thought his opinion was of that same situation. Don't take a chance, don't bend it. You can see the evidence of the contact with little Al earlier. Every time we get a good look at the nose of Paul Tracy's car, that may be a scar that will come back to haunt him in future years. But for the moment, it gives him a potential victory with less than half a lap to go now on Belle Isle in Detroit. Final set of turns for Paul Tracy. So very close to Canada and many Canadians in this crowd. So he'll get a hearty reception as he comes down to the checkered flag and there it is, the twin checkered flags come out, and Paul Tracy takes the win. Today will be the first time the Penske cars have won five races in a row. Emerson Fittipaldi comes by in second place, so it's Penske 1-2. Robbie Gordon charges for the line in third place. He is unchallenged at the moment. Roger Penske walks back ready to celebrate as the rest of the team celebrates here. We look back to the start-finish line, as here comes Michael Andretti chasing Teo Fabi to the finish of this race, and he finishes in fifth position. So the top of the field, Tracy, Fittipaldi, Gordon, Fabi, and Michael Andretti. And with a Canadian flag, Paul Tracy now takes a victory lap here on Belle Isle in Detroit. And when we come back, we'll talk with our new winner. 
Paul Tracy with a big smile as he has taken his sixth career win and Jack Arood is with him. Well, Paul Tracy, not far from his home in Canada. Congratulations on your first win of the year. Well, it's a tough way to win that way, but, uh, you know, we were in there battling. I was pacing myself, and, uh, you know, 20 laps to go, I knew we had to make a move soon. So it was, uh, it's a tough way to win that way, and uh, I'm going to have to do some apologizing to Al. Yeah, describe what happened there with, you, with your teammate, Al Unser Jr. Well, we got into heavy traffic on that restart, and I was real close to him, and uh, guys in front braked real early, and I just ran out of room and touched his back tire and sent him sent him into the tire bearer. So that was frustrating, and I know, I know I made a mistake, but, you know, we, we were able to bring both cars in 1-2. Well, a 1-2 sweep. Emerson Fittipaldi joining his teammate, Paul Tracy, here. Team Penske, the juggernaut, continues. Emo, close again, but no cigar. Well, no, I really enjoyed this race. I mean, it was very difficult. I start on the back. I had a moment with Nigel because of a slow car ahead of me. Nigel hit on my back. I nearly spun, and that was a fantastic race. I'm happy again. The Marlboro Team Penske did so well. And I'm catching the points, I'm happy. Points are so very important to this team, and especially to you. Sorry? Points are so very important to this team, especially to you. Well, I think so. Uh, you know, Jack is, after Indianapolis, I want to really try for the championship. And I was trying to save as much as I could the last few laps to finish. I remind the Long Beach and I broke the gearbox. I was really easy on the gearbox. Well, no gearbox problems today. Paul Tracy continuing to take the accolades here in Victory Lane. And, Paul, one quick last question that we want to know about is what do you think you will say to Alan Sir Jr.? Uh, the only thing I can do is apologize and offer my hand an apology. It was my mistake, and uh, you know, I'm sorry I put him out of the race, but you know, it's, I'm glad I was able to keep going and Emerson was able to keep going. Gary Gerald, you can't say much more than that, but you're with the captain. On, well, Gary, indeed we are, Jack. Two-thirds of this team is happy, and uh, Al has gotten out of the car, Roger, and is elected not to talk to anybody at this point. I guess you're the designated spokesman. So already we have heard now from Paul Tracy that he says, I owe Al an apology, and that'll be the first thing he will tell him. Can you tell us, first of all, why is not Al electing to talk? Well, Al finished 10th uh, in the race. I think that uh, he was disappointed. Obviously, he ran a great race. Uh, I'm sure that he and uh, Paul have a discussion about it at this point. Uh, congratulations, to, certainly, to uh, Paul and to Ammo. Uh, it's unfortunate for Al, but, you know, this is tough racing. Uh, you know, they ran out there together for a long time. The restart, they were behind the, the slower cars. They were trying to lap them, and just one of those things I saw where, I guess, uh, even uh, Mansell got into Emerson, so it was uh, awful tight racing. When you're the leader of this juggernaut that's having such success and you let virtually three men have their way on the racetrack, do you worry about this type of a situation unfolding? Well, you always worry about having, you know, one of your cars uh, involved in an accident with another one, but, you know, you need to keep the competition going. Uh, certainly, I'm sure that, you know, Paul learned something today, uh, but again, I can't tell him what to do on the racetrack. We try to give him the best cars. I'm disappointed, obviously, that we didn't finish Al up front, but again, uh, that's racing. Will you sit down with the two drivers or is it strictly between them? Well, I think I'll have something to say. At this point, they're over 21. I'm sure they'll have their own conversation. <laughs> well, Roger, we appreciate your time, and the juggernaut rolls on. Thank you. All right, let's go back to Jack. Well, Gary, there's also a team walker, and they have brought their car into third place here. Robbie Gordon, congratulations. Long day, short day, describe your ride. Well, it was pretty difficult to pass here. You know, it was unfortunate that, that we had a bad qualifying run like 10th, but we came up to 10th, and these guys started up front, and, um, you know, we finished right there with them. The crew just did an awesome job in the pits today. I went in the pits eight the first time. They got me out sixth. Next time we went in, we held our position. You know, a couple of cars um, crashed out in front of us, and we passed one, you know. This track's very difficult to pass, but I got to credit Derek Walker and his crew for preparing such a good car that, you know, I, did, I just rode along. Robbie, what's the biggest thing you've learned in your career? Compare this point last year to this point this year. What's the biggest thing you've learned that's different? Well, you know, we, we did a little bit of testing over the winter, and I learned that you don't have to drive the cars 110%. You know, I'm driving this car 90%, and they're, they're doing a good job. You know, the Penske cars are just outrunning us right now, but we'll get a handle on it within time. When the Penske cars run as stout as they do, how tough is it on you and the rest of the team? Uh, you know, it, may, it makes it very tough, but um, we're not going to give up. We're going to stay up late at night and try to catch up to them. Paul? So Robbie Gordon, who finishes in third place. And by the way, the racing is not over here on ABC Sports. Right after we finish our coverage here, you want to see some terrific racing with a very surprising finish. The International Race of Champions from Talladega. That's coming up next here on ABC Sports. But still, there are more people to talk to here in Detroit. We'll be right back. Back at Detroit, shades of last year. On the right in the hat, Chief Steward Wally Dolan back. Kirk Russell, one of the officials. Jim Swintall, the starter. And Carl Hogan, the partner with Bobby Rahal, 
Also, Chip Ganassi has been up in this conversation right at the wall, and they are angry about something. Jack Aroot, can you update us? Yeah, Paul, basically what it is, it's a spirited discussion would be the best way to describe it. And it's about procedures as far as cars under the yellow being waved by. Near the end of the race, Teo Fabi, along with Robbie Gordon, believe it or not, Michael Andretti and several others were questioning whether they were waved by properly or not. So it's basically just everybody trying to clear the air, get it straightened out, and determine what they should do next. Waved by, you mean that they were, they were waved by wrongly or that they were not waved by? In one case, not being waved by, in another, way, in another case, being waved inadvertently or inaccurately. But this is, very, this is very typical of what happens in many situations where you have to grab the chief steward afterwards and plead your case. For more, let's check with Gary Gerald. Gary? Well, here's Teo Fabi, and he's one of those who's involved in this particular scenario. Tell, tell us now what has happened from your standpoint. I guess there was a question about moving up or by lapped cars under the yellow flag. Well, I think they definitely wave uh, Gordon and myself by. So Gordon went by and uh, I was racing with him. So I decided to, to go with him and uh, went by, we went by to uh, this uh, lapped car, but they definitely wave us by. Now, was there any indication from any of the officials that there might be a penalty because of that? No, nope. no, no indication. I think uh, Gordon went to the victory circle. So I suppose <laughs> he's third and I'm fourth. And you are fourth, and that is your best finish thus far this year, seventh in Australia, seventh in one other event. And this was one of those days when things just kind of came to you, it seemed like. I think it was a good day for the Penzoil team. I think we, we finally were being able to, to race the whole distance with, uh, with good guy. And, uh, you know, fourth is not the position we want to finish, but uh, it's the first step, and uh, we, we try to improve from from here. Several times this year, you've had problems with boost. Did you get your full 45 inches today? Uh, not yet, but we are working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's sneaking up on 45 inches of boost, and he's sneaking up with a grin. Congratulations, Paul. Thanks. All right, Paul. Well, Jack Aroot did pose a direct question to Chip Ganassi and Carl Hogan, and they both refused to answer on camera. We'll continue to trace this, but Paul Tracy is the winner. The Detroit River, Belle Isle below, one of America's most recognized corporate symbols. The Goodyear blimp hovers overhead providing aerial views of the Detroit Grand Prix. Gary Gerald now is standing right next to the Chief Stewart, who maybe can clear all this up for us. Well, Wally Dallenbach, tell us about this discussion that's been going on now with Carl Hogan, with Chip Ganassi, and I know it's about this business of being waved by cars under the yellow flag. What is your procedure? Our procedure is if there's going to be a wave by by any car, it has to be done in front of race control or the starter. If it's done anywhere else on a racetrack, it's not accepted. Was it done in front of the starter and was it accepted? The one that they're talking about was done on the backstretch. And so that was not been accepted, so will there be a penalty? No, as far as the penalty is concerned, they understand that situation. That thing was corrected back there. It was corrected back there. Yes, it was. So you're happy with the way they came down, and you're happy with the way this race is finished? Well, yes, I'm happy the way it came down. There was some wave buys down here, two or three of them, and they were verified by the starter, and we accepted those. Thank you very much, Wally. You bet. All right, let's go to Jack. Well, Gary, we said at the top of the show that the Honda logo was back with a vengeance. Bobby Rayall, you had a fine ride, even though you were involved in some of those yellow flag situations. Yeah, you know, we just uh, we lost uh, about four positions in the first pit stop, and that you know in this track, if you can't you can't pass. So, and we're down on the straightaway to these guys anyway. So it was great handling. You know, the car was super in the corners, but uh, a little frustrating. You get close in the corners, and they'd leave you down the straight. You get close, so the whole the whole day was like that. But it ran strong all the way to the end, and uh, you know we got some points. I'm disappointed. I think we could have been uh, third, but uh, hey. You know, we're, we're running strong, we're qualifying well now, and uh, we had a good race in Milwaukee, good race here. We'll just have to improve at Portland. Paul, they're on an uphill swing, going to the road courses. Yeah, and that's great for Ray Hall Hogan as well. Well, that conversation is not entirely over. Michael is now talking to the Chief Stewart about that uh, wave buys. Here's the unofficial results, and we emphasize unofficial. Tracy, Fittipaldi, Robbie Gordon, Teo Fabi, Michael Andretti, and that great run by Bobby Ray Hall with a Honda. Then we'll know. Grusselman, Perda, Al Unser finishes 10th, but still, he's had a terrific year thus far. As we look down now through the rest of the field, the entire rundown here with a note that little Al has completed all but four laps this year. We've run 829. 
Blau has win been in 825 of those. Here are the points as they close on Allen Sir Jr. with Emerson Fittipaldi. Now in contact range just behind him. And you can see there why Michael Andretti is arguing.